you had a show at the start of the year, but did you have other shows planned for this year? I, I did have one that was supposed to be coming up in November, Blindside. Is that still going to go got, ahead? No, it got postponed to June next year, which is fine. I was a little bit not particularly sure about having a deadline. It was kind of a really weird time to think about really close deadlines, especially around stage four when you can't even go to the studio. So you have so, a studio and you can't you can't go there at the moment? No, um, everyone decided not to go. So hopefully by next week it might change. But I've um, just been doing some work in the backyard kind of mainly working with clay so it's been fine i was supposed to be doing a residency in berlin june for two months june july i had my um flight booked and sort of um paid the deposit for the residency and secured some funding from Australian Council. And then I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll be spending June, July at home. <laughs> um, Where was, was the little, residency? At um, ZKU in Berlin. Most likely I'll only be doing one month once we can fly again. So I'll do it again. Like I'll definitely do it once we can travel. So if it's not next year, the year after. So the um, Australia Council, I mean, obviously they're going to be understanding, aren't they? Yeah, they like super helpful and understanding, so. That's fantastic. Well, that's congratulations on getting the grant and lining it all up. I mean, that's-, that's Thank you. So that were your plans for the year, a show in November and a residency? Yes, and kind of didn't want to have a really intense calendar as well. <laughs> Oh, so you're already, happy. you'd already had that in place before COVID happened? Yeah, uh, no, even during COVID, I, I'm a little bit kind of changing my perspective about how I approach my practice and how many projects I do for a year, per year. So, um, I don't know, I'm just trying to not have too many things in one uh, year because I've done it before and I've, I found it quite stressful, so trying to minimize and kind of a little bit enjoy my practice a little bit more as well. How did you become an artist? Ara? I mean, I know you've got a really interesting life. You're Armenian. Your family is Armenian. Is that right? Yeah, that's well, right. Yeah. Um, so my family were survivors of the genocide. So they were kind of part of the diaspora. My parents met in Baghdad. So I was born in Baghdad and we sort of were supposed to go and live in Germany in the early 80s then my father passed away so we stayed until the first Gulf War finished and then um, we went to Jordan and applied for a visa to come here and we just waited for two years for us to sort of get the visa to migrate to Australia. Right so, so how long did you spend in Baghdad? Um, I left when I was in grade nine. Right so you're a teenager there you're a fairly... I was a teenager yeah. You're a conscious human being. Um, were you were you making art then? It's kind of a bizarre thing because like I didn't grow up in an artistic family or anything like that, so I wasn't really influenced by anything in particular. But I did always paint, and I actually I didn't paint. I just did a lot of drawings. Drawing was big part of my sort of hobby I guess when I was younger and then I more was into making after that and I was um in the fashion industry for like eight years or so all right so I, when after after school yes so um I had my own label and designing making in Melbourne selling to a few boutiques and then kind of got sick of it and it got a little bit difficult financially around the recession time Okay. I just decided to close the business and go to art school. And it's pretty much the best decision I've ever made. <laughs> so, so I was a little bit older. I was 30 when I went to art school. But I was, little, I was very aware that it's not going to be a career that's going to sustain me financially because I already ran a business and had that financial struggle. So I have a feeling if I went to art school when I was younger, I would have really struggled and left very quickly. <laughs> I just gave up. So, you know, there was that awareness throughout my undergraduate that it will be more of a difficult career in, in regard to sustaining myself financially. So I think that's a kind of a good awareness to have. When people go to art school, at an older age, they do come to it with that awareness that this is this is something I want to do despite despite the sacrifices that I'm going to have to make. Yeah. Did you study fashion or you just went? Yeah, into I did. I did like um, three years. It was more of a practical course. Oh, yeah. um, so you're doing you were doing creative. You were in a creative generating creative things in the world. Yeah. How did you start getting exposed to contemporary art? I've always had an interest in sculptures. So I was always interested in making 
So it was kind of a, I, I knew that if I want to have a speciality within the arts, it's not going to be painting or drawing. Like I knew I'm really interested in using my hands. And also you probably uh, had a very conceptually a 3D brain, particularly from making clothes. Yes. Even though with the clothes, it was quite restrictive. So it wasn't as liberating as I, you know, because I went to fashion with very sort of avant-garde sort of approach. And so I found it quite restrictive in a sense. Then it's all about the buyer and what the buyer wants. And then I started to sort of introduce few lines that I wasn't interested in just to keep afloat. And I think that's where I, where I went, like, it's not really, it's not really for me anymore. I'm not like, I didn't have that desire to continue with it. And Australia is a very small country when it comes to a market. So if you can't break into like a European market, it's quite difficult to do or to have an interesting fashion career. So where, where did you go to art school in the end? RMIT. So I did okay. my uh, the sculpture department. And you, did you just do the undergrad or did you go on? Further. Um, I did, after that, I was kind of enrolled into my, into honours, and then I left the honours and I did the master's in social science, environment and planning for two years, wow. which was kind of a bit of a hard decision to make because everyone in the art thought I left and, and I'm not going to be practising, and everyone within the social science thought it was really strange. <laughs> <laughs> attended <to laughs> a master's in social science um, but they kind of understood where I was coming from I have a feeling I was kind of really I think it was really beneficial for my art practice actually not do it my honours and go and do that master's because the research I feel that was a lot more useful and influential like but I missed out on being around art colleagues so it was yeah, you're a bit of a polymath, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> what What do you feel that you got from that master's degree? Um, well, I was really, I was interested in sort of urbanisation of cities. And also, I guess politically, I was kind of interested in why we do what we do as well. Interesting. Not just as an Australian nation, but like, for, for example, if it's like the Middle East or in Denmark. So, but in saying that as well, masters is not very long. It's almost you get like a taste of a particular topic. And by the time you get your head around it, the two years is over. So I do get why people do PhDs because, you know, you can have a focus mm. on just one topic over the three years. But not, not yet or... Not for you. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> maybe later. There's plenty of time. There's plenty of time. I think I think maybe old age is the time to do a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I just don't want to get more stressed in life at the moment. <laughs> well, I first encountered your work in Not Fair in 2017. And you had those fantastic tripods with, with plants inside them with their own atmosphere. And they, were, they reminded me of um, they reminded me of two science fiction references. One was Silent Running. Do you know that film? A 70s sci-fi film about a um, about all the forests on the earth are, are destroyed and they're keeping them in these glass houses out in space. Yes. And the other one was War of the Worlds with the tripods of the, the aliens. Yep iPods. How did you begin to think about those works? Um, is there a science fiction element or is there a, a world creating? They kind of got a planet-like feel to them. I think, you know, I have been influenced a lot by very sort of early science fiction and I feel like that sort of even unintentionally comes through my practice aesthetically but at the same time like um kind of see my work it's sort of it's more of a mix between sort of the past now and the future that kind of makes sense yeah but there is this recurring uh, motif which i've seen in your work of these spheres they're, they're like little worlds little little enclosed spaces and tripods are a bit of a re recurring motif that particular work that from 2012 to like maybe 2015 I was more interested in all these fragmented sort of um, parts around Australia that are divided by roads or suburbs and you have all these habitats where the even the animals are almost confused about which direction to take because we don't have corridors for example for them to move around so it was more kind of like for me it was more references referencing sort of loss of habitat. Well, they are little habitats that you're creating. They're little, little precious environments. And 
and they are always very fragile as well because um, all these ecosystems that are made kind of always looked pristine and they can survive for long periods but um, if you have one and you live with it for a few years they actually don't they need maintenance they're actually really fragile right temperature right sun right sunlight um, and it also depends what sort of insects so it's um it's kind of the opposite of pristine in a sense i, I also love the idea of an artwork that you need to nurture and, and care for not just hang it on the wall or stick it in the corner but you it needs atten constant attention yeah i love the idea of an artwork that contains life and I remember yeah. trying trying my hardest to sell um, your works to people in Not Fair. And, and, and ask. <laughs> I, never, I never think of my work commercially viable. So, well, we but, put a price on it. So uh, I remember. I did the price. <laughs> yeah. And talking, um, about, and it, talking to you about how, how, how do we go about selling this plant? You know, what do we, <laughs> do we get the instructions? <laughs> yeah. I think I was more successful in securing commissions to build a project. So it didn't necessarily go to, to an institution, but like I was successful with those works to get funding to develop a work. And I, I think that's, it's important just to be aware that the work that you're producing is actually, is not going to someone's home. And saying that it's itself. Sorry, pieces. It's important that they're not going to someone's home. Well, it's kind of a little bit upsetting sometimes when you <laughs> have that expectation that it's going to sell and you don't, you know, it's kind of... Well, you have to get over that pretty early. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> you, have to, you, have to, you have to be fairly stoic when you decide to yeah. be an artist. You have to expect the worst. Yeah. And because you were always also asking about the tripods and the the legs that I keep using in my work, I guess um, looking at ideas around fragility of, um, you know, whether if, if it's cultural or natural, I kind of like that sort of instability of the aesthetic where the pieces almost look like they can collapse. Yeah, there's a real tension there, isn't there, between stability and instability. Yeah, I can tell a lot of curators when they use the work they were really nervous about having it as well. <laughs> I'm like, it's totally fine. Like, you know, it's been standing in my studio for a few months. So, of course, I had to make sure the work is sort of capable of standing for a month, for example, before it goes to a show. I guess it's kind of a little bit poetic when it comes from sort of Greek mythology where a lot of early use of tripods were used in temples. Oh, uh, really? What, for uh, burning incense or...? For burning incense. Right. Well, it's the position of them in space that really comes across in your installations. It seems like the height of the tripod is very important. And also they've got such a presence in a space too, don't they? They become figures of they their do, own. Yeah. <clears throat> and is that... Greek antiquity, is that something that you're interested in? Is that something that you've explored? Not particularly, but I've had the question of why you're using tripods. I really think there's a lot of um, aesthetical value that we are so adapted to that we can sort of remake, then forget that why we actually made certain decisions to right. make a certain object. So I just... Sometimes I think maybe the awareness is important. I don't think I've ever made a particular work, especially spatial works that I've done, with the intent for it to be interpreted a certain way. It's never been my intention to, for example, reference three legs or reference the tripod or reference a particular science fiction movie. But that's been not to disregard anything, but I was kind of been interested to keep my work a little bit more open rather than have an emphasis about a certain topic, except sure. for the birth project that I did recently. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, uh, you wanted to have a, a, a sort of fruitful ambiguity about the work. Yeah. Yeah. So what was, tell me about this last project where you, where you decided, where you went in another direction. Um, it was, I guess this was the first one that was kind of my sculptural practice. I'm never aware of the outcome. So there's a lot of 
making and lots of failures within the and, studio. And learning, and learning through making, thinking through making. Yeah. And I use different materialities. So like I'm always exposed to something new. So there's a lot of, um, I do have a very studio based practice. So it was actually something that I just wanted to do. And I applied for funding through city of Melbourne, the COVID, I think they had decent amount of funding to go around. Uh -huh. And it was pretty much, I do a lot of walking in the morning recently sort of evolved into running, but I've always walked a lot around, especially around the neighborhood wherever I lived, always done a decent amount of walking. And for some reason during lockdown, just like everyone else in Melbourne, we started to pay a lot more attention to sound, where sound became really important <laughs> part of every day. Well, um, things got quieter, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> so I started, um, and before the lockdown happened, when I developed that interest in bird sounds during the bushfires, one thing that sort of didn't leave me, I, I found the bushfires, I think in last year's bushfires, one of the most traumatic things that I experienced due to the loss of a lot of animal yeah, lives that I found that was the most traumatic. But um, one thing that I was reading an article and a lot of the farmers were, after they went back to their homes, um, which is kind of a little eerie. They said it was there was silence. There was the absence of birds. And um, that sort of stuck with me. So when the lockdown happened, I knew a lot of the birds migrated to sort of inner city bushlands because of loss of habitat. So I was actually recording the birds, even though it's quite enjoyable. I have to say it was like a really fun project to make. I wasn't so much interested in distinguishing what bird species I'm encountering. I was actually looking at building a sound piece that is sort of works as the opposite of silence. So I recorded, and I was also asked for people to send recordings from around Australia. So it's not based around Victoria. So the whole idea was to layer the sounds on top of each other and work with the opposite of what happened during the bushfires. What was your idea for how this, was this going to be a piece that went into a gallery or into a public space? Or? Um, I was actually, my idea was to play the sound piece at my show at Blindside and possibly use it for Not Fair. That'd be or, fantastic. So I'll definitely use it twice. If you did the show this, say Not Fair, would you, would you show it with, with your objects? With yes. Your objects? I was, I had the intention of showing the piece with my objects and I also had the intention of playing the piece without me present in a very quiet laneway around the CBD once we can go to the city and do that. Well, it sounds like a very poignant and, and poetic piece. <clears throat> yeah. And, and what else have you been working on? You've been, you've, been, you've been making things in your backyard, ceramic? Yeah, I've been working with clay and making these um, small sculptural objects some of them are one-offs, some of them are additions of 25. It's been great. I've been selling them. <laughs> Fantastic. That's what I... Because I normally <laughs> don't sell a lot of work and it's been great during lockdown because I've been able to sell affordable small pieces and um, I don't know why I didn't do that earlier. That's great. That's, I'm very pleased to hear that. So are these cast objects? Cast and um, before I started casting the objects, I was working with much bigger, larger objects that were hand built. And I'm not a ceramicist. I don't see myself as a ceramicist. Um, and it was, I was having a great time building these incredible forms and started firing them and pretty much every single piece exploded <laughs> so i kept the last <laughs> i kept the last eight pieces um just as unfired pieces because I, I i quite like them and they're just sitting on top of my shelf so hopefully one day i'll get to do something with them are you firing them in the backyard as well was that where the disasters happened? no um during stage four i'm not firing but i did a friend of mine gave me access to her kiln while she was not using her space. So 
I was able to be a lot more productive in a sense because there was no commuting place to get a fire, pick it up and go back. And I was also not paying by the weight of the objects. So I was, that's why I was doing these really large hand-built sculptures. So what are your plans for the next year? You've got a show at Blindside coming up in June. Is, do you think that that'll be a completely different show to the show that you had planned? I find sometimes actually my vision of a particular project really shift and changes a lot <laughs> within six months. <laughs> so sometimes, I, most of the times I don't really have a clear idea. Even if I do, by the time the show is on, it might change. So yeah. um, I do have a few larger pieces that I made for the blind side show that I'm going to keep aside. Well, we're really looking forward to seeing the work that you make for Not Fair, whether it's new work or whether it's work that you've showed before, I think it's always great to, to re-show works in new contexts. I think no matter how many opportunities you get to show work and, and tweak it, perfect it, I think I think the more opportunities you can get, the better. Um, there's, there was one other piece I wanted to ask you about. I can't remember which show it was in, but you had these plinths that kind of looked like ice shelves or icebergs. Ah, uh, that was at the stock room. Is that what you were inspired by with those? No, I did want them to look fossilized. Uh-huh. And I, that particular show was a little bit more post-humanist in a sense with the materiality and the aesthetic. I was trying not to make anything that is readable in a sense. And I was a little bit nervous that it's going to look like <laughs> icebergs, but it does look like icebergs. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's just, there's always a story about a chunk of ice shelf breaking off Greenland or, or Antarctica. Yeah, but I was um, definitely not referencing global warming. I think that's one thing I, I try to avoid is to have this sort of really direct interpretations. As you said before, this idea that they're ambiguous in terms of their period of time that they belong to. There's, there's aspects yeah. of them from, from the past and aspects from the future. So in the future, I hope to see your uh, works from the past and the future and the present. <laughs> <laughs> when the, when the, it's a very confused piece of work 